to the chapter four overview video where we're going to cover balancing equations and reaction stoichiometry. So a basic chemical reaction has two parts, the reactants which react to produce products. And if you remember from chapter one, any chemical change or a chemical reaction is simply the rearrangement of atoms to form new chemical structures. For any chemical reaction, you have reactants. So for this example, this is a combustion reaction where you combust methane, CH4, and you, to combust, as we know from chapter three, you have to add oxygen as 2O2, and that all the time in combustion reactions yields CO2 and H2O. Now, these coefficients in front of the O2 and the H2O are for the purpose of balancing the reaction. And that's what we're gonna learn about is one of the main parts of chapter four is balancing the reaction. Because if we do not balance the reaction, the number of carbons hydrogens and oxygens are not equal in the left and the right side. So if we did not have this two here, there would be two oxygens on the left and then two and three oxygens on the right. But since we have these coefficients, we can now balance the reaction. So how do you balance the reaction? The way I like to do it is very simple. You go through each molecule in order and compare the left and the right sides of the equation, making sure the numbers of atoms are equal. Step two, add coefficients when necessary to balance the equation. And step three, check your answer. So if you first have this reaction of HgO yields Hg plus O2, you can see that you can go through each element. So go through mercury first. Mercury, there's one on the left, one on the right. Oxygen, there's one on the left and two on the right. That means a two has to go in front of the HgO. If you go back to check your answer, you'll now see that there's two HGs and only one on the right. Therefore, another two has to be placed right here with the singular HG in the product. So your final answer would be that. This is a very simple one, but we can have more complicated ones, such as the reaction of glucose and water, which is a combustion reaction. So what you first have to do is you can, you can look at your carbon. There are six carbons on the left only one on the right. So we have to put a six here next to the CO2. Look next, looking at the hydrogens, we have 12 hydrogens here. We only have two on the right, so we can put a six. Then oxygens, we have eight total on the left, and then we have 12 plus six, which is 18 on the right. Now, there are two sources of oxygen on the left. We do not want to disturb the first source, which is the glucose, because if we put a coefficient in front of there, it will mess up the entire reaction but we have a lone O2 next to it. We can then manipulate this. There are 18 oxygens on the right side. On the, on the left side, we have six oxygens already, plus this two. So minus the six, we need to make up 12 oxygens. So then we can then put a six on the left side of this O2. That would make 18 oxygens on the left, 18 oxygens on the right, and you can check everything else and it's balanced. So we can then calculate more about the reaction, knowing the balanced reaction. We can calculate how many moles there are, the mass of a certain sample. We can calculate a lot using the stoichiometry and the molar ratios. So for example, if we have glucose in the same reaction and we are burning 100 grams of glucose, calculate the mass of CO2 produced. We can first calculate how many moles of glucose is 100 grams, and we know how to do that. You take the 100 grams of glucose, divide it by the molar mass, and you get 0.55 moles. We can then look at the molar ratio between glucose and CO2 in the balanced reaction, which we just balanced. So if you calculate that, it's a one to six ratio. For every one mole of glucose, six moles of CO2 are being produced. So we can take the moles of glucose, multiply it by six, and that gives us the moles of CO2. And that would be 3.329. And then we can go back and we know how to convert moles to grams. So we can take the moles, multiply it by the molar mass of CO2, which gets us 146. So that's how you go. Using the stoichiometry, we can calculate relationships. So there is a more difficult type of balancing. So if we want to balance this one, C4H10 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. We can see the carbon, there's four on the left, two on the right. We place a two, or we place a four next to the carbon on the CO2. Then we have 10 hydrogens on the left, two on the right. We can place a five on the right to make 10 Hs. Then for the oxygens, there are, there, at this point, there will be a total of eight 
plus 5. So 13 oxygens on the right and 2 on the left. So what we can do is we can replace, we can put the coefficient of this oxygen as 13 over 2 or 6.5. Then we can't leave a coefficient as 6.5 because we can't have 6.5 molecules. We can have 6.5 moles, but not 6.5 molecules. So this means just like we did for empirical formula where we multiplied ratios by a number to make them whole numbers, we could do the exact same thing. So this entire reaction can be multiplied by 2 to get 2 in front of the butane, which is C4H10, 13 in front of the O2, 8 in front of the CO2, and 10 in front of the H2O. You can feel free to pause the video and try this one on your own. Another question you could ask is, based on the balanced reaction, how many grams of H2O will form from 134 grams of C4H10? For this, we first need to find the moles of C4H10. After that, we can use the molar ratios of the balanced reaction to find out how many grams or how many moles of H2O this will produce, and then we can use the molar mass of H2O to figure out how many grams by multiplying the moles of H2O produced by the molar mass of 18. So you can solve the video, you can pause the video and solve this on your own. So here's a really hard one. We can use the system of equations to balance reactions, but we're not really going to see many examples of that. Here's another example and another one that we'll see during class and more. So another key concept is limiting reagent. So in a balanced reaction, we know the stoichiometric ratios, which is the ratios of the moles, but we can figure out what is limiting, meaning if we have both reactants, we can figure out which reactant will run out first. Whichever one runs out first, that determines the extent of the reaction, meaning how much products will be produced. So what we can do, the way we do it, is we can calculate, knowing both reactants, how many of one of the products will be produced. So for this example, if we know the amount of CH4 and the amount of H2O we have, we can calculate how much H2 each one of those reactants produces. Whichever one produces the least amount is reactive. Or is, whichever one produces the least amount is the limiting reactant. And then from that limiting reactant, we can find out how much of the product is produced. So first we can calculate the moles. And in this question, we have a vessel with 300 grams of water, 250 grams of methane. What is the limiting reagent? And also it asks how many moles or how much CO is produced. We can use CO as our product that we're going to compare the values of. So first, we can figure out the moles of water and the moles of methane, and we do that with this math. Then, we can use the molar ratios to determine which one will produce the least amount of product. Looking at methane to CO, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Therefore, the moles of methane is 15.6. That will produce 15.6 moles of CO. For H2O, it's also a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning... We have 16.5 moles of H2O will produce 16.5 moles of CO. This should say CO instead of H2O. So this means that methane is limiting because it produces less CO if left to react fully. So that means there will be some water remaining. So we can calculate how much of it is produced because we know it produces 15.6 moles. We could then multiply that by the molar mass of CO, and you get around 530 or 437 grams. With percent yield and with uh, knowing how much product is produced, you can calculate percent yield using a theoretical yield, which is the calculated value based on the math we just did to calculate the product produced. You can also be given the actual yield, which is when you actually do the experiment. So the actual yield divided by the theoretical is the percent yield that you get. Here's an example from the homework that we'll work on during class. There are other types of reaction called redox reactions, which there is a transfer of electrons from the reactants to the products or products to reactants. It's different than the ones we've went over so far. Combustion is an example of redox, also oxidation. There are certain factors involved in determining if a reaction is a redox reaction. And we'll learn about this during class where we can assign values called the oxidation states. It's like a charge. So a lot of these char a lot of these oxidation states are similar to their ionic charges. For example, an atom by itself is zero. That one, well, I mean if there's no charge on it, it's going to be zeroed as an oxidation number. A monatomic ion is the same as its charge. Sodium, chlorine, fluorine. Fluorine is always minus one. Oxygen is always minus two, unless it's in a peroxide, in that case it's minus one. Hydrogen is always plus one. 
So these are some rules we can live by uh, for assigning oxidation states. So the idea of a redox reaction is that the oxidation state of the element has to change going from the reactant to the product. That's how we know it's an oxidation reaction. Reaction below, 3O2. O2 is by itself. The oxidation state is zero. When in this compound, we know oxygen goes to negative two. So the oxidation state changes from zero to negative two. And iron goes from zero to positive three in that case. So it's similar to deducing the charges. So we can solve these examples and, and determine the oxidation state for each of the atoms. We can do that more. And why do we need to do this? This is the question. So we can tell if a reaction is not only if it's oxidizing or reducing, but which atom is being oxidized and which one's being reduced by the simple acronym of oil rig. So oil rig stands for oxidation is losing, reduction is gaining. So oxidation is losing electrons, reduction is gaining electrons meaning oxidation, increase in oxidation state, meaning we are losing electrons. Just like when we increase charge going from positive one to positive two, that signals the loss of one electron. We can also, cause, we can also call the substance being oxidized the reducing agent, meaning it helps the other substance be reduced, if that makes sense. So it's facilitating the reduction of the substance that is gaining the electron. Similar to ionic bonds, when a cation is losing an electron and giving it to the nonmetal. It is facilitating the charge. A, redu a reduction is when you have a decrease in oxidation state, and this means when we're gaining electrons. So oil rig, rig, R-I-G, reduction is gaining electrons. And since we're gaining electrons, we are facilitating the loss of electrons from the oxidized atom. So this is what we call an electron acceptor. So if just these bullet points are pretty good. If something is reduced, it's an oxidizing agent. It is the agent that helps other substances be oxidized and vice versa. So here are some examples. We can calculate the oxidation state of every element in here. Pb would be plus two, O would be minus two, carbon would be plus two, and oxygen would be minus two. On the right side, Pb lead is now zero since it's by itself and carbon is plus four. So lead goes from positive two to zero, meaning the, re the oxidation state decreases, meaning it's reduced. For carbon, it goes from plus two to plus four. It is oxidized because it gains an oxidation number going from plus two to plus four. It also gains oxygens, which is another definition of oxidation. We can do some more examples in class, and that's it. So if you have any questions at all, leave it on the comments below and I'll be happy to get back to you. Good luck studying, and I will see you in class.